So I'll, I'll look to introduce our next speaker, uh, Farha Ibrahim, Principal Lecturer in Education at the University of Cumbria, based at our London campus. Uh, Farha is a, a Principal Lead for Education at the University of Cumbria, and she's worked for the University and formerly St Martin's College for the last 14 years, based at the London campus, delivering teacher training for undergraduate and postgraduate programmes. Prior to working for the University, Farha worked as a Senior Manager, Phase slash Subject Leader, in primary and secondary school settings north and south of the country. Farha is passionate about teacher training and the belief in high quality education for all. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Lee, and good morning to you all. It's great to be part of such an interesting and exciting day. Um, as mentioned, my name is Farah and I work for the University of Cumbria and I'm based at the London campus in Tower Hamlets, which is in East London. Um, and I'd like to talk to you today about an event that my students and I took part in over a year ago. And in order to do that, I will share my screen with you. So please bear with me while I display my PowerPoint so you can follow um, the talk. OK, I'm hoping that you can all see a great big bright yellow screen and um, that has the title Students Are East Samosa's Success. Um, and my title is a little bit of a play on words and it's revisiting something called the three S's. And it was a phrase coined by John Sentamu, who was the first black archbishop for the Church of England. Um, and he was also the chancellor for the first chancellor for the University of Cumbria in 2007. And his phrase was steel bands, samosas, saris, a phrase used to describe the sort of superficiality of multicultural initiatives um, that were often um, laid out in the UK in 2007 as a way of bringing communities together. Not necessarily focused on integration, but instead highlighting differences and not always in a positive way. So it doesn't necessarily follow that if you love samosas, you eat them every day, it doesn't mean you necessarily believe in multiculturalism. And you can like all of the above steel bands, samosas, saris, but <clears throat> still take part in racist violence um, or not. It's important to revisit approaches, um, but a one size fits of the same type of multicultural initiative approach um, does undermine the specifics of any context. So it was important to us all at the London campus to understand the context and align our objectives to it. So why get involved? Well, <clears throat> I was approached by my director of institute and I immediately assumed that many of the students would not be interested and how wrong I was. I thought many of the students would be busy preparing for their teacher training practice, their assignments and so on, but they were incredibly enthused about taking part in the um, multicultural Cumbria event, the, the Culture Bazaar event, as it was phrased or entitled. Um, the students wished to share their interests and practice their culture. And the important bit to recognise here in the statement is practising culture. Culture lives only when you bring elements of that into your day to day living and assimilating, becoming like each other, same food, same clothes, same language, same thoughts. Lee can lead to cultural monotony and death of creativity and innovative problem solving. So it was interesting that their practice of culture was at the forefront of their motivation to take part. The students also recognise that they're part of a wider university community and you know we're part of a university that has geographically diverse campuses. We have a campus in a heritage site in Ambleside, another campus in the capital city um, in an inner city environment. So it was really important that they were able to recognise one, the geographical diversity of being part of this wider community, but also the diverse student populations in each setting. So this was completely student drift, a little bit taken out of my hands in some ways and um, driven by the students. <laughs> Interestingly, they, went, they didn't wake up and they were not interested in living their best minority life. They just wanted to focus on sharing what they like to do, which goes back to the idea of practice of culture. For many, it was a chance to see Carlisle. Many students hadn't travelled that far north. They probably stopped at Manchester, but not gone any further. 
So here we are at Carlisle Rail Station and we were all super excited after a four hour journey on a, on a very slow train and having been a teacher for so many years, it was a little bit like taking year six on a trip. They were all loud and chatty at the start and positively quiet by Lancaster. Um, but the suitcases look as though they packed conservatively for two days, but actually there was a whole row of suitcases behind all of us that were stood there um, because they just couldn't, they hadn't been to that part of the country. They didn't know what to expect weather-wise um, and they needed to have choice in their outfits. So the event itself, the event took place at Richard Rose Central Academy in February 2020 and 12 education students took part. So these would be students that were either on teacher training, primary teacher training courses or education studies degree. And they devised a range of workshops, including, but not exclusive to the list I have here, a dressing up room. And that contains South Asian, a South Asian wardrobe and clothing, Bengali calligraphy, henna painting was two of the other workshops, South Asian cooking, so a demo kitchen. Seems superficial at first, but on closer inspection, there was much more to these activities than first met the eye. It was incredibly interesting how the activities were received on the day. So here we are, some pictures of us within the workshops themselves, either setting up very early or in our actual workshops themselves. So the dressing up um, workshop wasn't just about coming in and trying on vibrant clothes. It was more about understanding that Asian clothes are not this homogenous mess of garments. They're actually clothes that are very indicative of the regions of South Asia that they come from. So many of the people that walked in with their families, they dressed up, but they wanted to know about the beading, the colouring, the designs on the actual garments that were out, and also the shapes, the varieties, the names of those. There was a real knowledge exchange there, but at a much deeper level rather than, can I have the blue one or can I try on the red one? Um, henna painting and calligraphy, again, very much interested in the mechanics of writing there. Here's this language that's a hanging language that the uh, students were explaining. And the students themselves, many of them are practicing or uh, wanting to become primary teachers. And we're using a lot of those skills to, to sort of put across to children and to adults how you might write your name in this language, how there's not a direct comparison and some of the phonics behind um, speaking the language as well. And then in the corner, we've got a picture of the demo kitchen. And in this, there was so much excitement and discussion. In some way, it was a little bit isolated from the rest of the event because it was in a demo kitchen. But there were so many questions here. It was a very busy area. Lots of questions about um, the ingredients, the medicinal aspects of the ingredients, ways of cooking, how often people cook. Um, all sessions were incredibly interactive. So the outcomes and observations from the students. These are some of the statements that the students made um, in discussion with myself at the time and after the event. They talked about how they'd learned so much about themselves, the environment they were in, the people they had met. They were incredibly reflective in their processes of what had happened over the day. Many chimed about how they had enjoyed themselves. They'd had so much fun dressing up in their national costume and being able to talk about the things that form part of their cultural practice. There was food, there was sharing, there was humour, interest, people wanting to recreate dishes at home and asking where do these exotic ingredients come from? Can you only get them from East London? And finding out that actually they're stocked in Tesco's um, and that's where the students had picked them up from. There was lots in common and it gave the students, as they described it, a purpose to talk. It was a foundation to begin other conversations. So there was a lot of exploratory talk. And interestingly, on the journey back, one of the students talked about how insular it is. I mean, here we are living in the capital city and they talked about, well, actually, it's perspectives. If you don't look outside of London, you're missing a whole other perspective as well. So there's a lot of diversity within London, but there's also a lot of um, insular aspects to London as well in terms of the differing communities that may not necessarily um, 
come together. They talked about sharing food, life, and using food to bridge cultures that don't normally come together, that they may not normally speak to. So reflections. Reflections wise, a phrase came to mind of situated identities. So students took on um, a sort of myriad of characteristics, roles um, that they felt were appropriate for any given situation on that day. So they identified as Londoners, as EastEnders, as Cumbrians belonging to a vast learning community, South Asian Bangladeshi women, teachers, instructors and so on. And what was really potent was the, the opportunity to have authentic, unrestrained conversations where complex ideas were exchanged. It may have started with the food, but it moved on to lifestyles, what people do, issues that might be similar, different, quite complex conversations. And it sort of led to the idea that the three S's, or in my case, the four S's have their place as part of multicultural initiatives, but certainly shouldn't be confined just to these. They should be used appropriately according to context. So having an event such as this should have a follow up to it um, and so on, and not just always be the same initiative each time. It also allowed us to think about the curriculum, the education curriculum and the need for a wider education curriculum that reflects lived experiences. Um, education for diversity, not education for uniformity. Um, so we're not trying to be homogenous in our thoughts, our approaches, but instead we're valuing the diversity that comes through in how it expresses itself in um, better outcomes, better production, whether it's in um, a work setting or an education setting. OK, so what now? Key ideas. Well, preparing for an inclusive curriculum with a focus on expanding learning is absolutely key. We don't want a superficial curriculum. We don't want to just say we've got some books on there. We've got these authors in. We've got some brown people. We've got some black people. Off we go. We want lived in curriculum that isn't superficial. It's actually talking, as I say, about those lived in experiences. We want creative methodologies within our curriculum, very creative pedagogy. So we're not just thinking about the what we teach, how we teach it, but why we teach it the way that we do. Adding to curriculum content is important. It's not always about removing, it's about adding to what we already have and widening that lens through which we look. So our view is much more panoramic rather than tunnel vision. We can start to make links and understand how we fit in to other aspects, other areas, how curriculum overlap and feed into each other. So we need to see inclusion in practice, not just in schools, but in work settings, as mentioned, and recognise transformational power of education. There needs to be an investment in cultural diversity. Diversity and inclusion are so much more than a few mentions in an annual report or policy or even a workshop on implicit bias. It's in the day to day lived experiences and in enabling staff, pupils, students um, to be able to access that and bring that to the forefront and bring it into this mix of um, diversity of thought and opinion. OK, I have rushed through my slides incredibly quickly, but I wanted to end on a quote from Vandana Shiva. And Vandana Shiva is an Indian scholar, an activist, an environmentalist, the list goes on. And I would really encourage you that if you've never heard of her, read some of her things, watch some of her clips. She is truly inspirational. And Vandana um, talks about uniformity. She says uniformity is not nature's way. Diversity is nature's way. And Vandana describes herself as a 68 year old woman in a sari. So it's quite interesting that I start my talk with saris in the title and I end my talk discussing saris as again. So I'll stop sharing my screen. 
and just apologies, just coming back to the slides. Yeah. Okay, stop sharing my slides. And that brings me to the end of my presentation, which is incredibly quick. But I, I'd like you to, I want to thank everyone for listening to my account. And really, please feel free if there are any comments or questions that you wish to ask. If there's any questions, if I could ask people to raise their hands, I think there's a couple of hands been raised there now, so I'll just try and identify who they are for actually one second for you. Uh, so we've got Leslie Davidson there. Um, Rich, are you able to unmute Leslie for us? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you very much for that talk. It was so interesting. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, as to what advice would you give for people that want to try and encourage, um, you know, you know, um, kind of like to try and incorporate elements of multiculturalism within their teaching? How do you make sure that it is, you know, that level of authenticity that you're looking for and that kind of lived and creative experience? Because I think it's it's not something that is necessarily part of, say, the standard curriculum. What what do you kind of advice would you give to lecturers wanting to you know, do the right thing really for their students and to provide a very deep and meaningful education in the areas that you discussed. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, <clears throat> knowledge is the key to a lot of it. So when you're delivering lectures, when you're delivering any kind of practice in a classroom, are you approaching what you're looking at in a superficial manner? For instance, um, I was teaching um, counting to my students the other day um, who are on a teacher training course, and we talked about the origins of number and the global aspect of mathematics. And we were able to link to counting systems from other cultures and actually how English um, doesn't have place value built into the way that you count numbers. So if you're looking at um, languages in the Far East, they'll talk about the number 12 as 10 and two, whereas we'll call it 12. So that there's a lot, if you start to really read around your subject you will absolutely find all the connections there but it's getting that access and understanding and knowing that things exist to equip yourself empower yourself basically if that helps <laughs> okay i think actually for about a question come through as well via a, a chat so um, did the experience of the London students change their value of themselves and skills that we have through their culture? Absolutely um, and, and it's a really um, useful question to ask absolutely when they came back to London they saw everything so differently in terms of their practice um, and they talked more about understanding different perspectives beyond what they know in London. So we're, we're comfortable with what we know, but it's moving beyond that. And that experience gave them that opportunity um, to look at the world in a connected but larger way at the same time. Thank you. I think Graham's just raised his hand there. I think Graham should be able to unmute. Yes, I've unmuted. Um, <clears throat> being a southerner living in the north, it's good to hear that people come from London and find that it's not quite so grim up north as perhaps uh, people anticipated. Um, my question was, do you anticipate reciprocating having some Carlisle students down to London to see um, a different culture working in London? Absolutely, Graham. I think that is something that we, we wanted to do immediately, um, but ran into the period of COVID um, and very keen to do um, something in that manner. Absolutely. Do we have any further questions from anybody else in the in the chat? I guess I would like to cheekily ask them what was that was the main takeaways from the experience for from the, the students who were involved. I know there were some really good positive responses from 
you know, attendees at the bazaar? What did the students mainly take away from the experience? I think for the students, it was the excitement around sharing their cultural practices. Um, and really being very proud of that. And what was interesting for me, um, obviously I, I'm of Asian descent, but for me growing up in the 80s, um, it was a very different um, environment in which actually you didn't want to share your cultural practices. You didn't want to wear the clothes that you wore at school or you didn't want to show people what you ate. And this generation that I actually travelled with was so keen to wear their outfits, to you know cook their food, to talk about the ingredients, and it was so authentic that at, at the very basic level, it's a human connection. When we take away all of our labels and and the things that we do, it's it's a human connection ultimately that's happened there, um, and that made me think about my experiences. Um, very much so because very much like Sarge and, and a very sort of um, very emotional listening to you Sarge in terms of the experiences that you read out there in terms of the letter. Um, similarly there are lots of things that we carry with us all people do but one of those was about um, my approach and my experiences and looking at these students and how confident they were to share cultural practices. Thank you. I think we've got a question from uh, Fazeen Ahmed in the chat there. Uh, I think Rich, would you be able to unmute? Thank you. Uh, Fazeen, you're more than welcome to, to ask your question now. You should be unmuted. Uh, Rich, could you just double check if you've been able to unmute Fazim for us? I think it dropped off then on again. Sorry, I totally missed that. I was um, on the phone to Jal. Oh, thank you. Just if you could possibly unmute uh, Fazim Ahmed for us, who's got the hand raised to ask a question. Uh, yeah, no worries. Thank you. There we go. Oh, hello. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for an insightful talk about it. Um, I've actually just uh, posted my question, but I don't think you can see it. Um, I would like to ask whether your student teachers have emulated their experiences in participating in the cultural bazaar in their own classrooms and teaching experiences, and whether that can be considered a possible follow-up um, to, to this wonderful initiative. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely, um, Fazeen. They I think the students, as, as I mentioned previously, when they were back in London, and in fact the train journey back was incredibly interesting, they had so many ideas for how they wanted to incorporate practice, in their cultural practice into their teaching practice, um, in terms of a national curriculum that they're working with um, at primary level. They had so many ideas, and for several weeks after that, we talked about other projects in terms of our local communities within Tower Hamlets as well, and how we could have some outreach work there. But in terms of their practice, they were much more confident about interpreting the curriculum in a, in a deeper way, rather than as we, you know, we talked about superficiality. Way. So if we're celebrating Eid, are we talking about Eid in a homogenous way again? Are we not understanding that actually there are different practices towards Eid? There's an overriding umbrella in terms of how people celebrate, but actually when it comes down to individual practice, people do different things and that's their individuality. So yes, they were much more confident about practice in the classroom and interpretation of curriculum. I hope that helps. Oh, thank you. I think we just had another hand raised in the chat and trying to identify who that is. Uh, I think it was uh, Leslie Horton. Um, I think you're yeah. unmuted now, Leslie. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, hi. I was wondering about, I guess, the future aspirations of of those um, of those students, um, and whether they may have come into um, a teaching course thinking that they wanted to give back to their own communities in London potentially, and whether it had, whether it had influenced whether they'd like to perhaps 
maybe teach in parts of the country they'd never thought of before that wouldn't be open to them, whether it actually influenced what like their future aspirations as well as their, their current ways of working. Thanks, Leslie. That's really interesting. And definitely there, there was a little bit of both. Um, many of the students absolutely fell in love with the North um, and they talked about, you know, how much how much more cheaper it was than living in London, but how much more beautiful it was than living in London as well. Um, they talked about the, the green spaces um, and just the calmness that they felt. And that's in relation to any type of inner city living. Um, cities are loud, bustling areas. Um, and many of them talked about wanting to settle outside of London in terms of their own aspirations um, beyond moving outside of London. Yes, I mean, we are a widening participation university and one of the reasons you know it's very geographically challenged to say Cumbria in London but one of the reasons that we are in London is because of the local need the wants for local teachers to be working in local schools to have that longevity um, when working with um, the communities within Tower Hamlets within Newham, Barking and Dagenham and so on um, so I think for many it was about bringing that back to the actual um, practice their own ethos understanding that it's a much bigger world in terms of what they do so I think very much affected not just in terms of plans outside of London they were definitely those there um, but also thinking about their more immediate communities that they work with yeah thank you